Our speaker uh, today is Alexei Gorshkov, one of our own. Um, so very brief introduction. He did an undergrad at Harvard as well as his PhD at Harvard uh, with Misha Lukin and a brief postdoc stint at Harvard before moving to Caltech. Uh, and then he joined UMD in 2013. Uh, has numerous awards, which I won't you know, list all of, but they do include the P case as well as the uh, being a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, with that, we're really excited to hear what Lexi has to tell us. Yep. Let's see, just put it in the yep. pocket. Or should I clip it? Like it doesn't matter where it is. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Nathan. I guess Wendell for inviting me. I was actually kind of confused, like why this is happening. Uh, but they just said sometimes they do that. They sometimes invite uh, local people. So uh, last time I gave this was ten years ago, which is when I started, 2013. Like the people who just start give one, and I guess uh, sometimes you give one later too. So, uh, so last time, which was 10 years ago, I talked about Lee Robinson bounds. I could talk about them again. Actually, we made a lot of progress. Um, <laughs> made a lot of progress on these Lee Robinson bounds since, but I thought I will talk about something less heavy. Um, um, yeah, so we'll talk about uh, these two things, which are passive error correction and distributed sensing. Actually, there's a two separate things, so I'll give two short talks uh, instead of. Uh, uh, one long one covering these two things. We are working on something at the interface of error correction and sensing. Actually, we're probably posting something tonight, but I won't talk about that. Yeah, please interrupt with questions if we only get through, uh, you know, a small part of that. Uh, that's fine. All right. So let's start with passive error correction. Can uh, error-prone quantum bits uh, correct themselves? So uh, we all know that uh, for certain problems, quantum computers can be much faster than classical with uh, potential applications uh, in material design, drug discovery, and others. Uh, the state of the art, however, is that quantum computers, uh, uh, they already do uh, things that classical computers could not do, but arguably not yet anything super useful, uh, although we're getting there. Um, and uh, the reason for why they're not yet doing anything super useful at this is that quantum effects are fragile, um, and in particular, undesired interaction with the environment uh, and imperfect control of qubits uh, lead to errors. And uh, if uh, left uh, uncorrected, they just accumulate and destroy your computation. So solution to this is error correction. Uh, so here's how error correction works uh, for a classical bit. So I'll be just standing probably right in front of you. I don't know if you, I don't know, I don't know if that's an optimal seat. Uh, there's some other better ones. Uh, um, I think, I think I'm managing. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Uh, right. Okay. So here's how error correction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So here's how error correction works for a classical bit. Uh, so what you do is you encode one logical bit into many physical bits. So you encode a logical zero, which I denote by zero bar, uh, into three physical zeros and a logical one into three physical ones, and then uh, this code protects against that one bit flip error. So what you do is you just keep checking if all three bits are the same. And if they're not, then you use the majority vote uh, to correct the error. So error correction for a qubit works uh, in the same way. Uh, using the same concept, you encode one logical qubit into many physical qubits. And then it just keep checking for errors and correcting. Uh, except now that instead of one type of error, the bit flip, there are two types of errors. Um, either the bit flip or a zero and one flip or a phase flip where the phase between zero and one flips. Uh, so here is sort of the state of the art uh, in a quantum error correction. Um, in uh, 2022, uh, there was a, uh, an experiment from uh, uh, ETH Zurich where they showed a repeated quantum error correction in a distance three surface code. Uh, so distance three means uh, that you uh, need to apply three uh, sort of single qubit errors to change from one code word to the other. Um, and uh, surface code is a particular encoding of a uh, uh, logical lo logical qubits into physical qubits. So in this picture, these uh, nine uh, red uh, circles are uh, nine uh, physical or data qubits. Then the uh, remaining uh, eight, the green and the blue, are used to uh, make these repeated measurements on them to make sure that uh, you know errors have not happened. And you kind of make these measurements, and then you correct the errors that may happen. And here's a, uh, a more recent one from Google where they did basically the same thing, except uh, now a distance five surface code. So you need to make five errors to change from one logical word to the other. And then uh, um, uh, 
right, uh, distance five. And, and to do that, the, you had to use 25 uh, physical uh, um, qubits to encode one logical qubit. So the 25 physical data qubits are kind of uh, these gold ones. Uh, and then the others are, again, used for checking for errors. Uh, and uh, if there's an error, they need to correct. Yeah? So in either of these two experiments, do you know if the logical qubit I think they're sort of uh, kind of. I think they're kind of getting there, if I remember correctly. But I think other people would actually maybe know better in the audience. Maybe like, yeah, I think they're kind of getting there. That'd be my guess. But uh, don't, uh, you know, I'm not actually an expert on these papers. Not enough quicks people came, so we don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm familiar with some of the work they've done at Yale. Yeah. where they've done error correction. And I would say that they produce a modest increase, yeah. not even a factor of two right. in the lifetime of the logic over the lifetime of the physical Right. Yeah, so I think they're, I mean, I would say maybe they're getting there, but I'm not sure. Maybe they did get there, uh, but barely if they did. Um, that's a good question. Sorry, not a satisfactory answer. Okay, Could so- Can you just a little bit more about the difference between uh, the qubits that are used as data and what the other ones do. You just, uh, to make the, uh, like, uh, like remember this classical example uh, where you had like zero, zero, zero encoding a, a logical zero. So uh, to, to check whether an error has happened or not in the quantum case so, or in, in the classical, you need to check like are the first two bits aligned or the second two bits aligned. And if all three are aligned, it means there is no error. Um, so you need to make similar kind of collective measurements on qubits here. Like if you make a measurement individual qubit here, like that's not useful. You're just gonna project it out of your code. So these other guys that used to make collective measurements, like for example, this blue guy right here, which has connections to these four, it's used to make some, connect, uh, uh, some collective measurement on the four guys there. And it does it in a way that checks whether there is an error without uh, learning uh, which code word you're in. I guess I'm still not quite understanding. Would you want me to explain the full surface code? No. <laughs> no yes, I do, but not, not that. I mean, well, specific, specifically, I mean, I believe it's just a product of four X's, X, 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 X. Good, maybe? Let's go on. Okay, okay, awesome. So really, the question is, uh, you know, can we avoid constantly checking for errors uh, like is done here and here and then correcting? So the answer is yes. Um, and let me first uh, explain how such a passively protected uh, uh, scheme works for a classical bit. So let's arrange physical bits uh, in a two-dimensional lattice, n by n, and let encode, let's encode the classical logical zero and the all zeros and the classical logical one and the all ones. And then on each bond, let's engineer an interaction that favors bit alignment, that is zero, zero, one, one in such a way that the energy of any given classical configuration of zero and ones is the number of misaligned bonds. So this is effectively a ferromagnetic two-dimensional Ising model. Uh, and uh, let's start with the logical zero and try to flip it to the logical one by flipping bits one by one. So we first flip one uh, and we create a two domain walls, then we flip another one. So it doesn't show up correctly. It should have been, should, I don't know. Like, oh, yeah, somehow, let's see, is it also not showing correctly here? Yeah, something is wrong with the animation. So they, they should have flipped, uh, like all three of them should have flipped to one and now you should have like four domain walls. Uh, now you should have, uh, uh, you know, still four. Now one, two, three, four, five domain walls. Basically as you flip ones, uh, um, zeros into ones, you get more and more of these uh, red domain walls. Uh, and the point is that to go between the logical zero and the logical one through these single bit flips, you must necessarily go through a, a state uh, whose energy or the number of misaligned bonds is at least linear in N. Um, so as a result for large N and with cooling, uh, you get this passively protected classical bit. And actually I believe that's maybe that's how our classical hard drives even work, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, so now to get a passively protected qubit, uh, you need to passively protect the, both against the bit flip and the phase flip error. Uh, and one sort of idea is uh, you can kind of try to use this idea from a previous slide to protect against each type of error. And now if you kind of work through this, uh, you find that uh, you can get a passively protected logical qubit 
encoded in a four-dimensional lattice of physical qubits. So it's kind of like one two-dimensional lattice to protect against one and one against the other. I mean, it shouldn't be obvious, but that turns out what it is. Uh, and this is the four-dimensional Tori code, turns out, if you know what that is. If not, it's okay. But we live in, live in three spatial dimensions, so that's kind of uh, not optimal. And then the solution to this, uh, which I'll explain kind of in like the next 10 minutes or so, is to use a quantum oscillators instead of qubits as the building blocks. So consider, for example, an ion trapped in a parabolic potential or equivalently a single photonic mode. Uh, and uh, let the logical zero and logical one be these two coherent states uh, 180 degrees out of phase. So you can think about them as coherent states on the opposite kind of 180 degrees uh, out of phase in phase space or literally like uh, these pictures. And like in the 2D lattice, what we're gonna do is we're gonna design the system to favor these two states and penalize deviations in such a way that the larger this chosen amplitude is, the harder it is to for the noise to flip uh, between the logical zero and the logical one. Now, in using oscillators as, as qubits, uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, any kind of quantum variable, that's a quantum variable can be, that, that has two values can be used. Uh, how important is it that the amplitude of the coherent state is the same in all of your uh, your qubits. It seems like that would be a uh, sort of an additional thing that, that, that introduces a kind of a, an analog error if it is indeed an important feature. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I mean, I will explain how exactly we will be producing that and maybe, uh, maybe you can try asking that question there again. I mean, for now, I'm just really hand-waving in the hand-waviest possible way. Um, Right. Um, so, uh, so to get then a passively protected qubit, we need to correct, as I said, both bit flips and face flips. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a two-dimensional lattice idea, this classical IZ model, to protect against one type of error and use this idea of the oscillator to protect against the other type. And so the proposal is a, a lattice, a two-dimensional lattice of interacting oscillators that would encode a one passively protected logical qubit. I'll explain sort of in a little bit more detail how that works. Okay, so here's how it works. So consider uh, uh, a square lattice of photonic cavities. Um, equivalently, you can think of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, atoms and in, in, in parabolic traps. But I'll be using language of uh, photons. So then, uh, for each cavity, I will do two things. I will add a coherent two-photon drive in the form of this Hamiltonian. So uh, uh, it's either annihilating photons in pairs coherently or creating photons in pairs coherently. Uh, and in addition, uh, on each cavity, I'll, I'll add an incoherent two-photon loss given by this Lindblad jump operator with rate kappa two. So incoherently annihilating photons uh, in pairs. So in particular, so on each cavity, I forget about all the other cavities, so in each cavity, I will have uh, the following master equation where this Hamiltonian goes here, and this jump operator goes there. So uh, it turns out if you plug these things in here, you can rewrite this entire right-hand side of this master equation using a single jump operator L2 tilde, where this L2 tilde is almost the same as the original L2 minus a constant alpha squared, where this constant alpha um, uh, is determined by the ratio of the coherent uh, drive to the incoherent loss. And you can maybe kind of see that, that uh, you know, if you plug this in here, you get basically sort of a, uh, you, get a um, you get something that depends on this lambda. Um, and then you can um, see that uh, if you uh, plug it in here, you get terms that are kind of uh, linear uh, in this alpha squared and linear in this a squared. And this is what will give you the, the h. I mean, maybe it's not fully obvious, but you can easily check it. So you can write it in terms of a single jump operator. And then when you have a single jump operator like this, we can define a coherent states plus minus alpha was this amplitude of square root of lambda over kappa two. And then just by the form of this uh, uh, L2 tilde jump operator, these two states are exactly annihilated by it. So when A squared acts on a coherent state like this, it gives alpha squared and cancels with that alpha squared. So this L2 tilde jump operator exactly kills these two states. So it means that the steady state manifold here is a qubit spanned uh, by these plus alpha and minus alpha coherent states. So now uh, let's uh, also introduce uh, these cat states plus and minus 
which are coherence, which are plus and minus superposition of these uh, coherent states. Uh, and if you define the parity uh, as this e to the i pi a dagger a, where uh, for uh, even Fox states it's one, and for odd Fox states it's minus one, it turns out that this plus state uh, is an even cat, and the minus state is an odd cat. Uh, so the plus state is made up of only a uh, even Fox state and the minus one is made up of only odd Fox states. And so this cat code is actually pretty famous. So, I mean, we didn't invent any of that. It's called the cat code. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, kind of uh, preparing, you know, exactly these steady states using exactly these ingredients. Uh, and here's Bill sort of maybe, uh, I mean, you can try asking your question here. I mean, that's basically what's done in practice. So uh, you, uh, turn on uh, these uh, uh, you know, terms, and you basically uh, stabilize this plus alpha and minus alpha. So this actually ensures, uh, like the way that's constructed, ensures that they're really the same. It's not like I'm separately stabilizing plus alpha and separately minus alpha. They're really kind of stabilized at the same time. OK, so two questions arise in my uh -oh. mind. Uh-oh. <laughs> the one I asked before, which is, it seems like for each oscillator, you've got to be sure that the drive and the loss is the same as for all the other oscillators. Right, right. I presume that if you then now want to do two qubit gates and angling gates, which you have to be able to do. Yeah, we're not even we're not even going to do gates. Yeah, but, yeah. but 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 those gates would probably depend on right. what those uh, things right. were. So that's okay. I mean, it's true for every qubit. Right. Gate, you better make sure that they're right. all the same. Right. I so can... that would be the way you would have to do it here. The other one is, is the plus and minus, uh, is there anything magical about plus and minus as opposed to the i five? Nothing, nothing magical. It could be like that too. It's actually, uh, yeah, you can you can change that. Yeah, it's not magical. It could be uh, rotated. So does that introduce problems? The fact that you now have this sort of continuous. Uh... I mean, I can let me, so the answer to the, the answer to the kind of first question is uh, like the question is basically, uh, Suppose there are imperfections in these, uh, you know, H's in L2s uh, throughout the lattice. Um, and I haven't even introduced the, I mean, I haven't finished introducing the construction. Uh, I mean, it's not over yet. So, uh, so maybe I, I should, again, kind of uh, punt on your question. But, uh, but really the question is uh, whether this memory that we're creating, we're, so we're creating the memory only, like we don't know how to the gates yet, uh, is whether this memory is stable uh, to various uh, you know changes uh, in the various parameters, um, and it's sort of a, a physics question. It's a it's a question of whether our phase is stable uh, to perturbations, um, and actually, probably for the two dimensional lattice, it's not particularly stable, but actually for a three dimensional lattice, it's more stable. And, and what creates that stability? I mean, I haven't I haven't even um, like I haven't even told you what we're doing yet, so uh, I can't tell you. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Can you say something qualitative about what would happen if you also had a Lindblad jump operator that was just a single vote on decay? I will tell you exactly, like in a one slide or two. Yeah. There's no lattice. Yeah. Right. This is yeah. I just told you. I mean, I said there's a lattice, and I told you what I'm doing on each one of them. So they're not even connected yet. Right. Right. Okay. So this is just a summary of what I just told you. And now, what are we? How are we going to connect them? Kind of using this Ising uh, model idea. We're going to engineer nearest neighbor Ising-like uh, Hamiltonian uh, interactions on every bond of the square lattice that align the parities. So PJ is the parity uh, on side J, and we're going to create a Hamiltonian like this. So it wants the parities uh, of the uh, of these oscillators to be aligned. Uh, and there's some proposal for how to engineer this Hamiltonian. Um, and now let's imagine putting kind of this Hamiltonian in a cold bath. So you can either like literally put it in a cold bath or you can engineer like clever jump operators that drive it to the cold bath. It's sort of equivalent. Uh, but you want to make sure that this bath is colder uh, than this uh, interaction J. And then uh, uh, so uh, this first ingredient, which is done independently in each cavity, it sort of drives each cavity uh, into this subspace span by plus and minus. And the second ingredient tries to align on the, all the pluses with itself and all the, all, and the pluses with each other and all the minuses with each other. So uh, the result is basically that the steady state of this entire beast together is spanned by basically these two states. Uh, and Bill's question is, uh, well, what if you do some, uh, you know, uh, what if there are some imperfections on these J's, on this Kappa's, on these Lambda's, you know, uh, whether, you know, the picture is roughly the same? Uh, 
Um, and uh, again, uh, for a 3D lattice, it'll be more so than for, for a 2D lattice, because just the 3D uh, IZ model is sort of more stable than the 2D IZ model. Okay, but in as much as it's perfect, then these are the two eigenstates, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. right. And anything else has, has a higher energy. I will explain that uh, in a, I'll explain that, right. Yeah, but exactly, this is the steady, these are the steady states, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, can you remark on how the incoming of a coming of your company potential and the that is to affect your lifetime of your career? How, how what the, uh, and harmonic. Yes. I see, I see. Um, I think I will sort of, uh, I mean, let me, let me explain sort of relates to uh, Nathan's question a little bit. Let me tell you kind of the dominant errors we're considering. And then if it doesn't answer your question, you know, come back. Uh, so, uh, right. So this is the, uh, like the code space. Uh, and then, um, so how are we going to, how does it protect against errors? So let's prepare a logical state, uh, which is uh, some complex coefficient times a logical zero plus a complex coefficient times a logical one. Remember these plus minuses are these even and odd cats. And let's consider kind of the two dominant errors. So the most dominant error that we like, that's the whole reason why we build that is to correct against these two dominant errors. So the first dominant error is photon loss. Uh, so it's a jump operator AJ on a single site. Uh, so if you act uh, with this uh, operator A on this, on these, uh, on say on the state alpha, you get alpha times alpha and alpha is a, you know, positive real number. So it's basically proportional to alpha itself. But if you act with this A on the minus alpha, you know, you get minus alpha times minus alpha. So you pick up a minus sign. So basically this operator A uh, puts a minus sign on top of the coherent state minus alpha. And now if you see what it does to this plus minus encoding, it actually switches between them. So it switches between plus and minus. So what the single photon jump operator is trying to do is trying to basically flip all of those pluses essentially into minuses. It's trying to do a logical bit flip. But now hopefully you can use your intuition from this classical example uh, to believe me that these logical bit flips are suppressed by this 2D Ising model, since we require creating this extensive number of domain walls. Okay. And now the other dominant uh, uh, error process is a, is a photon dephasing where the jump op operator is given by A dagger A. Um, and uh, if you think of this jump operator instead as a Hamiltonian, possibly with you know, an oscillating uh, prefactor, such a Hamiltonian is trying to rotate minus alpha into plus alpha, right? So it's just rotation and phase space. Um, so photon dephasing is trying to actually flip from plus alpha to minus alpha. And if you look at our encoding, Flipping from plus alpha to minus alpha does nothing to the plus, uh, but it puts a minus sign on top of the minus. So it puts a minus sign on top of the minus. So this is trying to create a logical phase flip. So putting a minus on top of one of these minuses will give a logical phase flip. And now we are basically relying on this cat code. So it turns out that at large alpha, uh, uh, this dissipatively stabilized cat code makes it hard to flip between these two large coherent states, plus alpha and minus alpha. And it's precisely because these are two big classical you know, states, one here and one there in phase space, and it's just really hard to get from one to the other. Uh, so this suppresses the logical phase flips. And dissipatively stabilized means that cooling. That, that so the dis that so here, here, the dissipated stabilized here means uh, kind of this L2, uh, two photon loss, together with the coherent uh, Hamiltonian, two photon drive Hamiltonian for this part. For that part, this is also dissipatively stabilized but by the bath, okay. together with the Ising interaction. Two, two different kinds. Exactly. Two baths are kind of happening at the same time. And now to um, sort of to, to, to Yanchi's question. Um, so uh, you asked uh, about... Um, kind of uh, imperfections to say anharmonicity. Um, so it's, I mean, it's probably, I mean, a little bit uh, similar to that. So I think uh, you'll probably be somewhat protected against this. Uh, although, uh, you know, we haven't analyzed it too carefully. I mean, you shouldn't be uh, uh, like when we were deciding kind of what system we can implement it in, we really want to look for the most harmonic system. So you should not really be using a system that goes way on harmonic and you shouldn't be populating it at the point where this harmonicity is, uh, is too big. It needs some harmonicity for the L2 Yeah, maybe that's, yeah. Well, I mean, you can, uh, I guess you can introduce a, a qubit um, and then kind of use that to generate, yeah. Single cat 
Okay, so since I want to talk about two things, let me let me summarize. So one is a, by appropriately designing a bath for a 2D array of harmonic oscillators, we can get this error correction without measurements and feedback. Um, so here it's a 2D lattice. Like one question is, a, uh, is the 2D uh, lattice the lowest dimension? Can we do it in a 1D lattice? Or can we just do it somehow just in zero dimension? Um, and then of course, as Bill already pointed out, uh, we're interested in uh, um, figuring out how to do gates and measurements. We don't really know how to do that yet. So, uh, so that's the end of this first part of the talk. So maybe let's do more questions. Yeah, Jay. So what about what happens when your parameters drift? Like parameters drift. Yeah. So um, you had two photon amplification and two photon loss. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure about the drift again. So, uh, um, um, like no if you just consider. Yeah, so if you just consider, so if you just consider just the, the parameters are not what you think they are. So this is kind of the question about whether your phase is stable to like these particular perturbations. Uh, now, if they, um, if they drift um, in a way that you, uh, if they drift in a way that you know, then it's probably okay. You kind of know where you are. If they drift in a way that's not okay, that, that you don't know, um, yeah, then hopefully it can be, I mean, depending on what, I mean, the hope is that it will probably be a, hopefully a, a describable in terms of these noise processes that, that we do are correct. But I don't know for sure. Uh, because it seemed like you corrected for single photon noise processes. Right. Uh, well, I guess the photon number one, I'm not sure. But yeah, the, yeah these, are, these will be two photon processes. Yeah, not sure. Muhammad, I think, was next. So, uh, I have one quick question. Uh, this is this. Can I define like a distance for this one as well? Yes, yes. So, uh, roughly, you good? So, roughly speaking, I mean, the distance for this, there'll be two distances. There's, there'll be one distance associated with uh, kind of this. Uh, um, kind of one distance associated with that part and it'll be basically alpha squared it's the distance kind of between your cats between your alphas and the cat state and the larger the alpha is the better you're protected against uh, this type of error uh, and the distance here will roughly be given by the size of your two-dimensional lattice and uh, so there'll be kind of two distances and uh one of them you know will be exponentially suppressing you know uh, this type of error like e to the minus n but amplifying this guy polynomially, while the other one will be exponentially suppressing this as e to the minus alpha squared, but polynomial amplifying that. And these two exponentials will sort of. Uh... And then the, the, the second question was for the second one, the logical one. I'm sure you thought about it. How difficult is it? Is it does it mean that now my system, my distance is large, and my logical would be very difficult? I mean, how to do the logic? You mean how do the gates? I don't know how to do the gates. We want to think about it. Uh, huh? Yeah, I really don't know at all. It's just, it's actually, it's actually so difficult to design, um, like designing that Hamiltonian, the parity parity Hamiltonian is actually very difficult already. So the whole thing is, is actually a mess. I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm really thinking that maybe it's just a game. Like, I, I don't think this is really very practical. Uh, it's just really pretty uh, from a serious point of view. So your uh, logical state is this really highly, sort of like a GHC state, right? So it's very highly entangled state. Yeah. And so I might normally think with a state like that, that the the lifetime that it survives, you know, it's gonna be exponentially shorter as you make the size of your system larger and larger, right? The probability that I haven't had an error. Uh, and, but the energy gap that you're using to protect these qubits is growing, you said basically extensively with that. So it's, I guess it's not obvious, like is, is there like an optimum size, like for a given error rate or whatever, is there some ideal N in your lattice that you'd want to use or do you just always win by going larger? Yeah, so for this again, I mean, it's, I'll try to repeat again what I just said, I wish I had formulas. I didn't know how many questions you guys would have. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, so, so what, what this part you know, protects you against, uh, it protects you against uh, putting a minus sign on top because a single minus sign already kills you. Uh, I guess it was more on the, First, the I mean, the logical bit flip, right? So, uh, I mean, right. So, you basically want to send both n, which is the size of your 2D square lattice, and alpha, which is the size of your cat. You send, want to send both of those to infinity. Oh, that's 
next question. Actually, yes, but it seems like following up on what you were starting on, but it seems like you need a large, larger alpha with your hand because uh, your tendency for defacing error probably gets worse. Yeah, so the, the errors are something like, uh, I don't know whether you can, maybe under here. Um, yeah, so the, the errors are something like, I don't know, I mean, some polynomial of n uh, times e to the minus, you know, alpha squared and some polynomial, you know, and alpha squared times e to the minus, you know, n, something like that. So these are your two types of errors. So uh, like, like one of them gets exponentially suppressed with n, but polynomially uh, um, amplified by alpha, and the other one is exponentially suppressed by alpha, but polynomially uh, amplified by n. Yeah, the second one sounds good, but the first one doesn't sound good. Why? It's the same. What, what's wrong? Well, I mean, in terms of... Uh, 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 if I want to exponentially suppress something, it's easy to have a big n, but getting a big alpha. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. That's uh, exactly exactly. So well, so you need to look for these really harmonic systems um, uh, that allow you for large alpha. Huh? I think experimental evidence says that the reverse is true. Large alpha is much easier than large n. Well, no, the point. I mean, at least at the very least, you need to stay harmonic um, because otherwise you get other issues. If I want to make a cat large alpha. That's a very it's spatty. Made like a five second lifetime in a single one of these recently. That's how far up they can push the alpha. And you don't need alpha to be like super large. I mean, it's exponential, right? So that's our hope. I mean, that's our answer to the referees. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still not published. Uh, you got a patent though. It's application, whatever. I'm, uh, I'm required to uh, submit invention disclosures for all inventions. So it's not required by law. Okay, but, but I, uh, I, I wanna make sure I've understood the, the bath because that's a key thing. I mean, the, the, the beauty of this is that you just connect it to a bath and errors get corrected automatically without you. Except the bath is such a mess to design that uh, maybe you should not be doing it. Well, maybe so, <laughs> but, but I wanna make sure that I've understood what I mean. Yeah. So the one, the one that you you described as being a cold bath that could be in principle, I guess, uh, if, if if these are ions and you know cats, these kind of cats have been made with ions. In fact, it was probably the first place that these cats were made. So I could have a um, uh, sympathetic cooling, uh, and that could be that that could do what you want, at least in principle. <laughs> now the other one. I didn't Man. quite understand what the other one was. Is it the the damping part of the drawing? Exactly. It's, it's, it's an incoherent two photon loss. Okay. But, but and that needs to be us, designed very carefully, as Alicia pointed yeah, out. Yeah. But, but right, when you told us that each oscillator was driven and damped, that was the damping. Part. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Great. Yeah, but it's A squared damping, not A. Exactly. Yeah. It's very difficult yeah. to engineer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Over, and it's very impressive flips to get the two photon loss rate to far exceed the one photon. Yes, yeah. right, which is the one you're fighting against. Right, I I get that, good. Now, I mean, it's hard, but this is just a memory. Just a memory. Whereas at at this stage, at least. Just a memory. Is This is just a way of making a self-correcting memory. Exactly, okay. besides just a memory. Now, does it make any sense at this point to ask questions like, what do you need to do? What are the, the things you need to achieve in order to be fault tolerant? Uh, I mean, we're not ready for this yet, right? We don't want like, we need to first figure out how to do the gates, um, I would say. I guess what I'm asking is, is there- For a now, we're just asking, you know, how does this, uh, I mean, like the, the only question we can answer are, are those questions, you know, uh, what happens to our logical error? Uh, these are like kind of logical error rates. Uh, what happened to them as a function of these alpha and n? And they have these favorable exponential scalings, and uh, and that's 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 it. We're happy. Yeah. So I guess the kind of question I'm asking, and maybe that this is the answer, is for a memory, is there an equivalent question to ask? Is this memory full tolerant? In other words, is this memory good enough? I mean, you're asking, yes, yes, yes. Tolerant. So the question, exactly. So the question is basically, how do your error rates scale with whatever, like you have family of codes. Here, this family is parameterized by alpha and n. 
and uh, kind of a good memory. I mean, you can call it full tolerant. A good memory is the one where you can scale these parameters up and things will get exponentially better. This is the case here. Uh, So my impression was you cited for, for this for the one one of these things. Yeah, yeah. Like the first reference was a show called that yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my impression was even from before that somehow this had been done or was a useful thing to do, so should have been Yeah, exactly. So these uh these uh this aspect of it, the dissipated with stabilized cat code, as Leisha mentioned, there are plenty of papers on this, you know, uh, it works great. Um, I mean it's hard to do, but it works. Ah. Okay, so, so Alicia said it's hard to do, so I thought that was impossible, but it's not impossible. No, I said that alpha is easy and it's hard. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but alpha, but, so but, but the two photon loss thing. Yes, they, they know how to do those, those are called per cat qubits, and um, you can massively suppress the single photon loss. The single photon error. Uh, error, of, of, this right. also is, error. Yeah. This is also a lot I mean, like this loss. paper is like very good. Uh, yeah, yeah. This this con paper. I know Neil has cat codes and stuff so there's they know how to do this uh -huh. so it's tricky but it's been done yeah okay so uh, and the last the comment here is that uh you know uh, we have another paper that i'm not going to talk about it's some general bounds on the performance of passive quantum error correction but it's just an advertisement okay more questions on this yes uh can you follow up about the um, correcting memory like does the temperature has to be like basically hollow yeah, the temperature has to be just lower than that J. Uh, so J is the uh, uh, parity parity coupling between neighboring. No. Okay. So should I talk about uh, a little bit about sensor networks? We don't have to like uh, we don't have to go through all of this. Um, uh, right. So distributed sensing, quantum sensor networks. Um, so quantum sensors are sensors that, uh, you know, kind of use a uh, quantum in a fundamental way for sensing and they combine a uh, high spatial resolution, and high precision, because on the one hand, they're small. And on the other hand, all measurements uh, are fundamentally limited by the laws of quantum mechanics. So one example that people like talking about is these uh, defects in diamond, where uh, two uh, electronic energy levels uh, uh, have an energy difference that depends on the magnetic field and temperature. And so the system can be used uh, for magnetometry, such as magnetic imaging of live bacteria, or thermometries, such as this nanoscale thermometry of live human cells. Another example that I like are Rydberg atoms, uh, uh, where this uh, highly excited outer electron is so far away from the positively charged core, then there is a large uh, electric dipole moment, which makes uh, uh, these Rydberg atoms are very sensitive to electric fields, and uh, you can make a nice electrometer. Uh, so here's how uh, a quantum sensor uh, works. Uh, you uh, suppose that you want to measure this energy difference between two states one and zero, and then um, you write the Hamiltonian as one half theta z, where z is the Pauli matrix. So if you prepare the state zero plus one and evolve it under this Hamiltonian, then zero and one pick up a relative phase uh, theta t. Um, and then if you measure now this qubit on the x basis, the probability of getting the different uh, values of X obviously depend on what this phase is. And you can check uh, that uh, the best you can do is to measure theta with an uncertainty that scales inversely proportional with T. And this inverse proportionality with T kind of makes sense because if T is kind of twice as large, you're sensitive to half as uh, big changes in theta. It's kind of makes sense. So now if you have N sensors and suppose all N of them are coupled to the same uh, uh, parameter theta, um, so you can either use your sensors independently, so you prepare all of them as state zero plus one, do the thing that I just described, um, and then you get an improvement of one over square root of n. It's just your typical statistical improvement. And this is called the standard quantum limit. Alternatively, you can prepare this uh, GHZ or CAT state, all zeros plus all ones. It turns out both of these states are eigenstates of this Hamiltonian with an energy splitting m theta. Uh, and this means that as a function of time, they pick up a relative phase and theta t. Um, so in this case, uh, you see that theta sits in front of nt. So it means that your uncertainty is now one over nt. Um, so you can roughly think uh, that uh, this improvement from root n to n uh, comes from the fact that contributions to quantum noise from each sensor conspire to partially cancel each other out. And this is called the Heisenberg limit. It's the best possible measurement that's allowed sort of uh, by quantum mechanics in this setting. 
So now if you have a quantum sensor network, um, you uh, imagine that each qubit is coupled uh, to its own theta. So qubit i is coupled to theta i. And suppose we're not interested in measuring uh, every single theta. Suppose we want to measure only one desired linear combination. And let's call it, uh, you know, alpha i, theta i. So here's an example. We have four sensors. Um, each sensor has an unknown field, uh, 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 theta i, uh, and also a known weight, alpha i. That's a weight that we pick. Um, and then uh, we're trying to measure this one particular linear combination. So why would you care about this? Well, we could be interested in targeting a particular spatial profile of the desired signal, such as, for example, a Fourier mode or a spherical harmonic. Like maybe the signal we're interested in is concentrated on this side, or it's more concentrated on the periphery of the cell than the inside of the cell. And we'll dial in our question using these alphas. So, uh, so here's how the, uh, the optimal protocol works. Um, Let's assume that all the alphas are positive for simplicity. We can generalize and let's order them from, Z, from the smallest to largest. And also let's assume the largest one is one. Again, we can rescale, uh, it's easy to generalize, but assume all of these things. And let's uh, uh, start uh, again, uh, like in the uh, case of a single parameter, let's start with this GHG state. And what we want to do is we want the qubit i uh, to evolve in some sense or to pick up the phase uh, theta for a time proportional to alpha i. And this way, the phase in front will exactly depend on this q. So let's suppose, suppose we have three qubits. And I will write here two times the Hamiltonian. So for the time alpha 1t, I will have the full Hamiltonian. For time uh, between alpha 1t and alpha 2t, I will somehow try to turn off the first term in the Hamiltonian proportional to theta one. And for the last interval, I want to turn off uh, both the first term and the second term in the Hamiltonian such that only uh, qubit three is coupled uh, to our uh, parameter. So the way I can achieve this is I can either try to hide uh, you know, my qubit you know, into some state that's just not sensitive to the thetas, or like halfway through this red line, I can apply a pi pulse. And so it will accumulate forward and then backward. So, but you can think of just the qubit being decoupled from its uh, parameter. And now you see that a uh, theta one uh, is coupled uh, to the qubit for time alpha one t, theta two is coupled for time theta two t, and theta three is coupled for time uh, um, um, alpha three t, uh, where alpha three is just one. So what happens is that we design exactly what we wanted to. Uh, the zero, zero, zero picks up a relative phase of uh, basically uh, i times qt relative to one, one, one. So just designed uh, for this phase to appear right there. Um, um, and this is our q. And it turns out you can measure this by measuring uh, the product of the axis. So you can just measure each qubit individual in the x basis and compute this parity. And the uncertainty here, because it's i q times t, the uncertainty here is just one over t. Uh, and this is, turns out in the general case where this alpha is not one, it's just the largest alpha divided by T and turns out you can prove that it's optimal. So this was a, you know, this was a while ago. And since then we uh, sort of uh, generalized this to uh, lots of things and we're still generalizing. Uh, so suppose uh, instead of measuring a linear combination, suppose you want to measure any desired analytic function. Um, so there could be a linear combination, but it could be a product of the thetas, you know, some function. So the way you would do this uh, is you first measure each individual theta for a negligible fraction of your total time to get estimates theta i tilde. And then you expand this function uh, to first order around those estimates. So you evaluate q at the tildes, and then you write the first order Taylor expansion. And then you ignore the higher order terms. And then once you have this uh, function here, you use the linear combination protocol that we just derived to measure basically this uh, theta i times this. And this turns out to be, uh, again, optimal if you uh, kind of uh, make sure this uh, negligible fraction is chosen correctly, such that these higher order terms are suppressed, so you can prove that it's optimal again. Do you have to use one sub-ensemble of all of your 
sort of when you say you first measure your data i and then you linear Linear. It's the same ensemble. So you first use those same, uh, yeah, you, it's, it's all you have. You only have those N sensors. So you first uh, use some negligible amount of time to kind of individually measure the thetas. Then you're done with that. And then you spend the rest of the time doing linear combination work on the same ensemble. Yes, yes. It's very important. Yes. So uh, there is some assumption about how well uh, behave So, yeah. So for now, there are no errors here. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, if there, and if there are errors, you know, uh, oh, on Q, oh, Q, I thought, yeah, yeah. So Q, Q is a function, Q is a function that you want to learn, like theta one times theta two. Yes, yes, yes. And it's actually, we're, we're, it'll be interesting to consider non-smooth functions. That's one of the uh, things we're kind of, uh, we want to think about. But yes, yeah, so this assumes smooth functions. But if it, it has that form, that's guaranteed, isn't it? Now here, Q of theta one through theta n is just some form. It could be theta one times theta two, could be theta one times theta two plus theta three, any function, right? Any function it could be any smooth function that you can tailor expand around your estimates. Okay, right, I'm sorry, I was looking capital. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking really quickly, right? Exactly, sorry. Right. Yeah, so this is the so far part. And now we're generalizing to any, like this is the previous slide and this is this slide. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm fast, yeah. Did you worry about yeah, exactly. So these 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 are very important. Uh, the errors. That's what the entire paper is about. Uh, um, and uh, you know, your kind of estimate uh, will determine how how big uh, these higher order corrections are. And the entire paper is about making sure that it's okay and it's okay because it's squared. Okay. So, uh, so the next generalization is to correlated fields. So, um, um, so, so far, again, that's what we considered so far, where all of these theta i were uh, independent. And uh, right, that's what we did. And we want to measure this q. But now let's generalize. So let's suppose that the unknown parameters are some parameters, theta 1 through theta k, and there are k of them. But now let's suppose they don't couple directly to our qubits, but they couple to these qubits through some functions, f i of theta. And there are d of these functions and d qubits. And we want, again, some function q of these thetas, not of the f's, OK? So the thetas couple to the z's not directly, but indirectly through some functions. And we assume these functions f are given and q is given. And we assume we have enough sensors that if we just forgot about all the entanglement, and if we just spend a lot of time measuring you know, each of these fi's, by measuring each of these fi's, we can compute the theta. So roughly speaking, we assume that the number of sensors is larger than the number of parameters. Um, so in other words, uh, these FIs are correlated. Like if we have only one parameter you know, and 10 sensors, all of these Fs are, dependent, uh, are determined by this one parameter. So they're very correlated. So that's what I mean. We're generalizing to correlated fields. Um, yeah, and the problem is that if there are many sensors and kind of uh, a few parameters, we can't really directly use our earlier results because there are infinitely many ways uh, of expressing the thing we want uh, in terms of these fi's, and the solution actually turns out to be a uh, to find the best possible way of doing this expression. Really, I mean that's the answer. Yeah, so we found the optimal protocol, which I'm not gonna uh, bore you with. I'll just give you now uh, like one or two examples how that would be useful. Any questions? Or maybe I'm speaking so fast that I lost everyone. I don't know. Nathan is a uh, nodding. Mohammed, are you good? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mohammed. Okay, so here's an example. Um, um, and if you didn't even understand the previous slide, it's okay. So, uh, so suppose we have a, a unit electric charges inside this box uh, and Rj is on uh, our unknown coordinates, X and Y coordinates of unit charge J. So here's one charge that has X1 and Y1 coordinates right here. And there's another charge, it has X2 and Y2 coordinates. So we have four unknowns which are the four coordinates, like two coordinates of this charge and two coordinates of that charge. And together, these four unknowns determine the electric field everywhere. And we're gonna put now uh, a sensor right here. And F1 will be the Z component of the electric field at this sensor. So another sensor right here and three more sensors there. So I have five sensors, each of them measuring the Z component of the electric field at these points. So I have five sensors and four unknowns so in principle, if I carefully measure the field at all of these five places, I can invert, you know, my, you know, whatever ENM equations, uh, and I could compute where these charges are. But I don't want to do this. I want to do something more clever. 
Uh, and what I do depends on what I want to learn. Uh, so suppose I want to learn the value of the electric field right here at this star. But you know, suppose I'm not allowed to put my sensor in the box. I mean, suppose the box is closed. Uh, so I kind of want to compute this um, without like as fast as possible. Like there's the slow process, you know, just computing the R1 and R2 and then computing that. But can I do it as fast as possible? Um, and this is exactly the situation I just described. So uh, I have these parameterized fields. I have the five of these fields. They're determined by only four parameters and the same four parameters determine the thing I'm interested in. So can I basically get a shortcut that computes this value of Q without computing the values of R1 and R2? And that's what we saw uh, kind of in the optimal way. Uh, so Q doesn't have to be a single value of the field here. It could be some integral, for example, of the field over the entire region, maybe the integral over the field over the box. I mean, anything basically that can, you can express in terms of R1 and R2, which is basically everything, because R1 and R2 de uh, determine everything, you can apply this to. Yeah? I'm just gonna make C is out of the page. Yeah. And so it's zero, field outside the box is no, no, no. I assume the box is a like I assume the box is a you know a, it's just a wooden box. So uh, you know it. Uh, Place our sensors in three space or in that. We could, we could. I just for simplicity, I assume that uh yeah we can we can put them anywhere. Uh, I just want one parameter with each sensor so that there are five of them and four unknowns. Good question. Um, right. So you could also play the same game, for example, with nuclear spins that produce magnetic fields. Same game. Um, so another game we're playing now uh, is uh, with uh, volcanoes. So, uh, um, so let's suppose you have this volcano and you have five sensors uh, around it and each of them is coupled to some parameter Fi. And these parameters can be, for example, either a local gravitational potential or a local gravitational acceleration, depending on what your sensor is. And uh, uh, these parameters actually are typically determined by a few independent variables, theta i. So, for example, you know, under some assumptions, if you know basically kind of the shape of this uh, magma chamber here, uh, you can imagine that you have only one parameter, the density of magma in this magma chamber. And then the single parameter determines all five of these. And then uh, maybe um, you kind of know, um, you know, the probability of, uh, you know, the volcano to erupt, uh, depending on like kind of what's happening to the density of magma in the magma chamber. Um, so you can imagine uh, using this uh, quantum sensor network to come up with a detection scheme for volcanic eruption by kind of monitoring um, the density uh, of, uh, of magma in the magma chamber. And we're kind of trying to work out all the details of how that would work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's actually not entirely a classical optimization problem. So. Uh, uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to entangle these sensors to get the answer to our question as fast as possible. Uh, and the way we're going to entangle them and the way we're going to like pulse them uh, is going to get us our specific answer as quickly as possible. You could do it classically. You know, you could individually measure F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5 and compute kind of your density in the magma chamber. And that would be classical. Well, you would still be using quantum sensors, honestly, but without entanglement. Uh, and that would just be slower. So what we're doing is, you know, faster, you know, assuming you can distribute entanglement between these guys quickly. <laughs> <laughs> is there any way of checking if your model is actually correct? Right? You're, you're assuming that there, everything is only determined by just the density of the magma chamber. What if it was also dependent on some other crud? You know, is there a way of checking that there isn't this other right. I mean, you could first. I mean, you could uh, become a like a volcano scientist, you know, and uh, you know, forget about all this quantum stuff, and for a long time study, you know, how things depend. Uh, um, yeah, I, you just have to rely on sort of. Uh, it's. I think the answers will be as good as your model for what's going on inside. I mean, you can spend a long time. You can you know spend a long time, for example, uh, studying like what is the shape of this chamber, like. Kind of forgetting about eruption, just you know, let's assume it's not erupting, and then uh, you kind of study it, you map it out, and then you put all of this kind of in, assuming this doesn't change, and then uh, kind of uh, plug in the things that do change. I guess the naive kind of question would be could you use like F1, 2, and 3 to make a prediction, F4 and 5 to make a prediction, and see if those agree with each other? Some things like that. Yeah, that's good. I like it. It's a classical, <laughs> classical uh, geo, uh, geoscience, I guess. Yeah, but like you wouldn't want it like that's 
like the reason they're doing tango is do things quickly, right? But I think the answer to your questions, they're not so sort of time sensitive. Uh, so they can probably be done in a classical way, and I'm sure they've, they're doing it. Uh, oh, so many questions. I'm not sure who was first. Uh, I have to ask my group leader because uh, you know he determines my uh, uh, everything. Uh, how fast you can get the answers? Seems like the real question is how fast you can get a certain uncertainty. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's basically the same question as like for a single parameter. Remember, there's like one over root n versus one over n. I'm basically trying to get this one over n with the optimal possible prefactor in front, and this requires entangling them. And uh, to get and and the kind of the optimal prefactor depends on exactly what the question is and how I entangle them. Also depends on the question. So uh, I'm just trying to first of all get one over n in front, and second, the best prefactor. I'm not sure who it was. I there was too many. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe follow up on the on versus possible, and also this like question about uncertainty. Like this is a bit different from like I understand the motivation for doing sensing in this way, but like if you imagine those sensors are actually coupled to some like quantum variable, like instead of like a classical mm. like, coordinate, if you are actually coupled to like an operator that has some yeah. special distribution, like can you imagine doing something that would not be accessible using like just a like individually measuring the sensors. That's a good. So you're saying, like, suppose these thetas are, you know, uh, not actually like a classical parameter. Suppose there's something like a part of a quantum state. I think it's a great question. It's one of the questions I'm interested in. I, I don't know exactly what to do. It's one of whatever 13 open question we currently have, or 18, I forget. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I sort of have the same question. It's probably not sure the most specifically what is the difference in physical time scaling that you should measure. Yeah. It's just it's just one over n versus one over root n. It's the same thing. Like is that in this particular problem, does that make the difference between days and minutes, or between? In between what? Say it again. Does that make the difference between days and minutes, or between seconds? Oh yeah, we haven't. I don't think we've gotten uh, to that yet. That'll be great. Yeah. I mean, also, really, the question is how hard it is to entangle them. So really, uh, so maybe maybe you give that to me for free, and then I'll give you an answer. <laughs> yeah, so Bill? there's another issue, and that is that. I think it's a, as a general rule, it's not worth entangling your sensors unless exactly. each individual sensor exactly. is already exactly. unlimited. Exactly. What's Very good. The chances that that's going to be the case. Yeah. So uh, you know, I mean, they're they're getting there. You know, they're getting there. So you know, these sensors are some kind of interferometers. You know, are we're you know, you're dropping some uh, some some atoms. So uh, it certainly doesn't make sense to uh, you know. Uh, uh, entangle them to each other unless every interferometer, you know, is appropriately kind of squeezed uh, and kind of entangled within itself. But, you know, people are thinking about this. You know, this is, I'll, I'll show maybe some references later. No, actually, I will not. I'm done. Uh, so maybe I should wrap up. Uh, so any last question quickly? Um, okay. All where they should, they are just large stuff where inside of black box. Oh yeah, so I, this is the same question I think as you should ask. So I'm assuming the stuff I'm studying is classical. These parameters theta are classical, and the quantum stuff are just my sensor that I control, so I know exactly what's happening to them. But you can ask uh, this. I mean, you can basically uh, sort of. It's the same question, Yuxian. So uh, uh, it's it would be interesting to study kind of the quantum thetas. Um, let me stop. So. Uh, um, let me go to these to the thank you. I'm going to skip the outlook. Um, yeah, so let's see. Let me thank, first of all, the uh, um, the uh, quantum memory people. It was mostly Simon and Leo, uh, but lots of other people uh, as well. Um, that we're kind of currently working on some extensions of this with uh, Zemin and Braden and others. Uh, um, also, uh, yeah, this paper that I mentioned by Aulis, uh, briefly by Aulis Victor, uh, and also Simon and Leo. Uh, and on the sense of networks, like, and this is just one slide, there's another slide like that. Um, so there, there, are lots of, there were lots of papers. I talked about just a couple. I want to talk about more, but we ran out of time. Um, so uh, the very first paper was by, by Zach. So now the people who are leading this are Jake and Adam. Um, 
So Pradeep also played an important role. I mean, lots of other people, Steve here, lots of people. And currently we're also working on some stuff. So error correction, uh, you know, there's an error correction paper that we're submitting with these guys. We're discussing with Paulette, you know, uh, how to, um, how to do something uh, with, uh, with photons. Um, we're talking to Alex, Yusuf, and Carl about how to do encrypted sensing. Um, uh, you know, we're talking to you know, others about other things as well, uh, and many more. So I mean, I've talked to Ron about, Ron about this stuff, to Nathan. Uh, you know, we even wrote some sort of proposal. Um, yeah, so thank various uh, past and present uh, group members, funding agencies, and thank you.